Uh, Good to have you. Indeed, the pleasure is all mine. Okay. Yes. Um, a lot of things have been happening in Nigeria. Indeed. Politically and otherwise. Yes. Um, could you tell us what is the perception about this country presently? Yes. This currently, as currently constituted, is can be akin to concentration camp, where citizens are forced to stay in. And if you doubt me, if you think that Nigeria is not a concentration camp, let's run a social experiment. Let United States of America alone make their country visa-free to Nigerians. And let's count how many of us will be remaining. So that is what best describes this nation. A nation where the, the rich are not paying for doing business, for buying private jets, but the poor are taxed to pay triple the price and now quadruple the price of petrol cannot be said to be a nation for poor people. This nation is anti-poor. By and large, it's an anti-poor nation, anti-poor people's nation. So that is my take. In terms of the economics, in terms of the polity, it does not favor the average Nigerian in any way. So a nation where minors are being arraigned for terrorism, for saying, oh, we are hungry. This is the reason why we are protesting. Please, government should help us. Government should stop insecurity. In response, government say, come on. Lock them up for 93 days without food. Starve them, you know, and above all, slam them treasonable felony charges and parade them like common criminals. And this is a nation where police chiefs in this country, they are hustling to take pictures with bandits in Zamfara. They organize elaborate ceremonies to, re, to uh, according to them, they say reintegrate Boko Haram members into the society. They you arrange minors and children for terrorism and treasonable felony charges. So our nation is an irony. Okay, talking about the, uh, the arraignment of the minors, those minors recently, you were part of those who... Uh, actively ensured that uh, those guys were uh, released. What really happened? What did those children, what did they tell you? Well, from day one when they came to Abuja, they were brought to Abuja and we started seeing them, even before they arrived, uh, and they were, arraigned, they were arrested by the DSF, some by the police. We started speaking with their parents. Many of the minors were just in front of their homes. Police came to raid. Uh, it was a joint task force of police, SSS, and other schools. They came to raid. So anybody that is seen on site, on site, they just arrest them. So like one of the minors that the mother uh, still called me even yesterday was just sitting in front. They were playing football. So immediately they had police, police, everybody started running. You know, it's a Nigerian thing. And as they were running, police arrested both the adults and the minors. The, anybody they just see on site, they arrested them. And subsequently, we started tracing where were they, where have they been taken to. They said, oh, they were taken to Kaduna. Some say, oh, it's Abuja. So we kept doing back and forth between first, first uh, uh, CID, first headquarters, and the notorious abattoir, where there's now uh, IRT and the uh, uh, kidnapping unit and all that. So that was where we eventually found them. There's nobody. And I'm on record, there's nobody in this country that we did not meet, except maybe just maybe the vice president and the vice, that we didn't beg that these children be released to us. You know, and we kept at this for over two months. When it became obvious and clear to us that everybody would say, oh, we have others not to release them. We have others not to, we had to go to court to go out and force their arraignment. And if not for uh, our, the actions that we took to file fundamental right proceedings against the government and to put pressure on ensuring that the kids were arraigned, I can assure you that the kids will not have been arraigned 93 days later. You know, we had gone to Justice Winters Court on three occasions to move applications and the police intentionally will not come. And it was at the last adjourned day that we told the police, we told my, my, uh, the court that if the police does not come, and the children must be set free. Only for us to be now be told that, oh, 
The police have just filed charges against the children and other uh, protesters who were arrested in Kaduna and Kano. So that was what led to the arraignment of the kids and the international embarrassment that we saw in open court on the day of the arraignment. A situation where the government arraigned minors for treasonable felonies. Now, we know this is a very major charge. And then later on, go back and withdraw the charges. Doesn't it make the government, Tinubu's government, look like a joke? The government is not just a joke, it's a tyrannical regime. That's the, that's the only way to de define the government. You know, the irreducible minimum in a democracy is the rights of citizens being respected. How can protests be treasonable felony? How can protests be equated to treasonable felony? Bandits that bandits kill traditional ruler in, and in other bands, bandits have been killing people in other parts of the country. Have you seen any of them being arraigned in any court? Not one person since Tinubu has come on board. Not one bandit has been put on trial. Not one Boko Haram is facing char charges. But because he's a chief protester himself, you know. He does not want any form of dissent or criticism. He does not want any form of opposition or protest. They feel that by slamming treasonable charges and, and commonalizing and trivializing treason, the offense of treasonable felony, that they'll be able to scare people from protesting. We, we just finished protesting today in Abuja. Uh, how many treason felony, treasonable felony charges can one government file you know, in its four-year term? You know, so, the truth of the matter is that the, the aim was not to prosecute the kids. The aim was to deter people from protesting. They wanted to send a clear message that if you try it, we will detain you for 93 days. If we can detain children, who are you that will not detain you? We will detain you, we will dehumanize you, we will starve you. They denied us several access for seeing the children. Denied legal representation in contravention of the constitution. Deny their families and their parents from seeing them severally. What else can be more than that when it comes to issue of torture? That's torture. Deny them from feeding. That's torture, simplicity. You know, so these are the problems that the government is not just a huge joke. You know, the government, is, this government is not different from a military regime. There's no difference. Tell me, Abacha did not arrest or arrange children in open court. This president fled the country. Well, he didn't want to be arrested when Abacha was looking for him. Today is the one arresting children and putting them on trial for treasonable felony. While bandits roam, roam about the whole country. Free! Bandits operate for seven, eight hours unchallenged in most parts of the country. Look at Kaduna. They've ceded most parts of Kaduna to bandits. Sokoto, Kebi, Zafara, all ceded to bandits. Kidnapping is have, have, kidnappers have, are having a field day in the country. The kids cannot protest bad governance. Kids protest bad governance. You arrest them, you imprison them, you starve them, and you slam them to them with charges, then parade them in front of the camera before the whole world. But who do we hold? You made mention of something now that while you were going about trying to get the government to about the issue. There were instructions from above. So who do you think can you pin can you pin point that a particular office or somebody from above when you're the game president? The president is the person to blame and nobody else. The box stops on his table. Every day the president gets security reports. So you want to tell me for that for 93 days. The president did not have any report that minors were arrested in from Kano and Kaduna. The president does not want to feign ignorance. When the first protesters, 11 people were, pro were arraigned before Justice Witte, he did not know. Then, all the, the noise that we kept making about that minors are in custody, all these things, the president is going to say that he is not aware or he does not know. Of course, the president is to blame. He's the one that gave the order for people to be arrested during the protest. When he said that protesters should stop protesting and come forward so that they can meet them. When the protesters stopped, did you see, see them making any effort to reach out to protesters anymore? The only uh, step they took was to arrest and 
put, lock everybody up. So he, the president is to blame and nobody else. Okay, okay, come um, During the 2023 election, you were among those who um, were vocal. You, 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 you said Tinubu was not actually the right person for Nigeria, apart from Sowore. So now, 2027 is ahead. Tinubu, from all what you said, he has fed woefully. Woefully. Now, who do you think will salvage this country? Left to me, I'll say by now, we should be discussing issues of critical stakeholders coming together. Tinubu and the APC, they are the common de de denomin de denominator who are the main enemies of Nigeria. At this point, you should not be, oh, this person is better. Oh, they, no, 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 no. Let all the political stakeholders in the country come together and fight the APC government and Bola Metinobu. Let them provide credible opposition. Look at the recent concluded election in the US. The opposition were united, united against the Democratic Party. All critical stakeholders rallied around behind Trump. And the Republican Party because they knew there was no third force distraction in the US. So, and that's why people, everybody knows what they are doing. That's why you can see Don Yokupe after he was saying that uh, Peter will be Peter will be today, he's supporting Tinubu. You understand? So, that distractions must be avoided in 2027, if, even if they will stand any chance. Whether they will stand any chance with Tinubu and INEC collabo is another thing. You understand? Because uh, just like I, I, I humorously said after the US election that. INEC could still have saved Kamala because what INEC cannot do does not exist. You know, and I stand by that word that indeed INEC is one of our major problems in this country. Why do I say INEC is one of our major problems in, in this country? Since 1999 till date, people have been stealing ballot boxes in Nigeria. People have been buying votes. People have been snatching ballot box and infringing harm on voters and party agents. No one person has been put on trial by INEC. So, INEC, our security agencies who commando and provide cover for electoral malpractice and region, those are our main problem. Yes, many Nigerians will tell you that uh, even the legal profession, the judiciary are complicit. But if INEC were to be credible, were to be truly independent, we will have less problem. Another way for political stakeholders, since we already know that majority of the people in INEC are politicians, card carrying member of APC. You have Professor Gumos from Bayelsa, who we are in court with. This that, that we kept we have been saying that this woman cannot be an INEC National Commissioner. She's an APC card carrying member from Bayelsa. Majority of the INEC commissioners that have been appointed are APC card carrying member. The only way for us to prevent in going forward what INEC is currently doing by determining elections before elections occur is that let us now agree that INEC is a political party. It's a partisan organization, institution. That let us now agree collectively that all political parties should nominate people to be INEC commissioner, national commissioner. APC will nominate an equal nomination representation in INEC. If APC is nominating 10 people into INEC, PDP, Labour Party, NMPP should also nominate 10, 10 people. Then we can now give the president discretionary powers to appoint the INEC chairman. Then uh, if, we, if that becomes the case, it will be impossible for anybody to rig any election using INEC. Because the critical stakeholders will be on the table and they will never agree. You will never have an INEC consensus to rig for a part, particular political party. Because by not doing so, we are still deceiving ourselves because the people who are there are politicians already. The National Commissioners and INEC are politicians. Take it to the bank. I'm the one. My name is the Daddy Yoju. I'm the one saying it. They are all politicians. They are not, they are not independent minded people. Don't you think P2B would have done better than Tinubu if I won the, the, won the last election? Yes. Left to me, if Tinubu is on the ballot, Atiku is on the ballot, Peter Abio is on the ballot, even if, and I don't drink alcohol, I've never drank alcohol in my life. Even if, assuming without considering that I'm drunk, I will vote Peter Obi among these three people. But what changed the factor for me is I cannot have a showare on that ticket, on the ballot, and still vote uh, Peter Obi. Because ideologically speaking, Peter Obi is not that much different from a baller meant in the world or an article. 
because all the capitalism campaigns they run it together i will remove first subsidy I'll, why is it that you, you must always remove first subsidy why can't you remove subsidy for the politicians and the rich people do you know how much we are subsidizing dangote in this country nigeria practically subsidized dangote dangote is living on the lifespan of nigeria do you know how much we subsidize for akpabio goes with akpabio and those people in the national assembly do you know didn't you read the report of that the first lady wanted to travel one time and she changed naira into dollars I, I can't even call how much was changed haven't you seen the president buying a new jet haven't you seen they said the vice president need a new jet some people in Bornu even they said they are not east stakeholders that the, the vice president life is in danger they should buy why should a poor poverty capital of the world why should we be buying jets for politicians who are not productive every year they buy brand new cars so, why should I think that Peter will be a thick word in Why should I think they are different when they preach the same thing? When all they do is capitalism, capital, they are slaves of IMF and World Bank. So going forward now, if we are to make, even though we have not really gotten into that stage of politics and all of that, but looking at these three persons, which candidate do you think should come together to make a stronger bond that will be able to bust that is that is their business or when, there should be a new left candidate. left to me left to left to me i'll go for a new breed left to me because believe me what will these people do that others have not these are based of the same feathers they have been They've been there. They've been doing these things over and over again. It's the same thing. There's nothing. They all preach removal of first subsidy. Do you understand? It was only Omar Elisho Ware that was different among them. So, left to me, but as bad as even considering them as an option is, I would still advise that the Atiku, Peter Obi, Konkoso should come together. At least it's better for them to come together than for them uh, spreading themselves thin and being divided which is one of the things i condemned and criticized during the last election and they only united after they lost i think they even had the joint press conference to cry and wail what is the problem with p2b people believe you hate him so much why do you hate p2b well sincerely speaking i don't hate any of these politicians i just criticize them you know nigerians don't love to be criticized it's not a, it's not about a leadership it's not only the leaders i don't love to be criticized i know nigerians generally don't like to be held accountable or criticized you know nigerians generally they have god complex and that's why they also treat people they support as some demigods you know and you can actually see the god complex visible in our polity you know uh, most nigerians block people who criticize or insult them i think i'm one of the only nigerians that even retweet criticism and insults and slander and libel uh, even some people feel that ah this person called my name i'm going to sue i'm going to, ah, i'm going to why is all that necessary really why shouldn't we tolerate dissent why shouldn't we tolerate criticism why do people see criticism as hatred well i met in the way we say we hate him we do this we are criticizing you nobody hates you and after all what, what i was saying paradoxically is that these guys none of them is a messiah peter b is not a messiah he's not different from the bullion van convener in the villa that they are all the same. That's just what I was saying. That after all, he invested Anambra State money in his family business. How can that be amount to hate? I'm just simply stating the obvious. But will you suggest a situation where Atiku steps down and supports a younger presidential candidate in the next election? Ideologically speaking, if we are being serious, should Atiku even be, still be contesting? Did they swear for him with uh, contesting for a presidential election? Do you know since when Atiku has been contesting? The entitlement, now that uh, Trump has won, do you know Atiku now is believing that now that Trump has won, that is also his own Emilio Khan? He, his, his supporters have been gingering since Trump won. That, ah, look at Trump is almost 80. Nobody in 2027 should say that Atiku should not contest. This and that. Were you born to contest every election? Should you not be tired? Should Latiku not be tired by now? 
of contesting and perpetually losing. So, how can you be feel so entitled? And that is my problem with Aliko Dangote. He feels entitled. The guy went to court to say that court should stop other people from importing fuel into Nigeria. That now that he has a refinery, is the only one. That, that is an article behavior. That's an article behavior. It's only somebody that feels that the country was created for him that will feel so entitled. It's like, have you seen some people that will refuse to work in life and say that the reason why they are poor is because their uncle has refused to help them? That is how Atiku and Dangote is. That's how they are behaving. Can you Talk, talk, talking, say... about, talking about Dangote, you, 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 are, you are one of the persons that never believed in that project. You say you, you, you think that um, Dan Gote was only playing on the ignorance of Nigeria, so not even know uh, how the refinery things and all those things is doing that is doing work. For instance, when he started his refinery, people believe that the moment the refinery starts working, the fuel will crash to maybe uh, five naira per litre. But today we are buying fuel a litre for about uh, one thousand two hundred naira, or about more than. So why 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 is this so? Because the reason is because I know that I know Aliko. All you need to do about a man, it's like Tinubu coming to say that he's coming to fight corruption. A bullion van man come to fight corruption, a capitalist saying that, oh, if I come, things will be cheap. How? So I said it, I've been vindicated. Just like during the last election when I said this division within the opposition is counterproductive. They say, ah, DJ has come again. But I was vindicated eventually. So, Dangote, we never, ever want things to be cheap. He will never, ever want things to be cheap. And that's why you see him making all this drama and crying. He will start a propaganda counter it, then start another one. There's nothing I've said about him that has not turned out to be true. How can fuel that is brought from Argentina, Brazil, how can it be cheaper than fuel that is refined in Ibeduleki. You are not putting it in a ship. You are not paying duties on it. But the fuel that is brought all the way from Brazil is cheaper than fuel that is produced in Ibeduleki. And you say that and you say that somebody like me should be deceived or be vulnerable about Aliko that we all know. There's no business that Aliko Dangote goes into that he does not want to monopolize the business. So and the oil and gas sector will not be an exception. People like Dangote, they only thrive when there's monopoly. And what am I saying? A nation should not be built around individuals. Nigeria should not be built around Aliko Dangote. The way that we build refinery for Aliko Dangote, we should build refinery for other people. So that we can now have 10, 6, 12 refinery. Let's see whether Aliko Dangote will not abandon his refinery and go into another sector where he can have monopoly but we have four refineries in nigeria that is what does the do side can we kick start if those refineries are kick started will it give them the room for his money of course our four refineries combined we can produce almost six hundred thousand uh, four hundred and something thousand liquid and gotes refinery is just about six hundred thousand uh, thereabout so of course, if the refineries work, and that is why I support the idea of selling the refineries. Because, because of corruption, bottlenecks, I, I generally have been saying it over the years that government business doing business in Nigeria. Because they are not effective managers. So if we sell those refineries, including the modular refineries, Aliko Dangote will not be able to tell us what determine market forces. The reason why fuel is almost 1,200 today is because of this so-called Aliko Dangote refinery. Before the refinery came on board, we were buying fuel in this country for a hundred and something naira. It's part, partly the reason why there's hyperinflation in the country. Because the idea is that, oh, he has a refinery now, so let's allow market forces. All over the world, government subsidized products all over the world. In America, in the UK, even the IMF that is misleading Tinubu, they cannot dare to go and tell people in America that they should remove, fuel, they should remove subsidies. They even subsidize walnuts abroad. Walnuts. Let IMF go to, the, to, to Canada and tell them that they should remove, first subs, they should remove uh, product subsidy. Or they should go to the United Kingdom and tell, tell the United Kingdom government or that of Ireland that they should remove subsidy. They will not dare. But they come to third world because the third world leaders are naive. They come and mislead them. And after they make their mistake, they start mocking them. 
IMF was just mocking to Nubu Dorade that they are not the ones that told him to take the bad economic policies uh, that he has taken. So, that is that. We see there's so much hardship in the country. We, what are those policies that Tinubu missed that brought about this hardship? And how can he yeah. trace his step to ensure that he puts the country's economy back on the right track? Tinubu will not retrace, retrace his steps, that I'm sure of. With the policies that brought us here. The removal of first subsidy and floating the Naira. Everybody warned, everybody that knew the dangers warned. But the man said he was going to do it. And even when, see, leaders must be humble enough that when they make a mistake, they are willing to accept their mistake and quickly remedy it. Even when he has seen that the Naira is depreciating daily, he continues to grandstand in error. He continues to further devalue the Naira. Even when you are seeing that removal of first subsidy is affecting the economy, they continue to persist in their folly and continue to double down on their bad policies. That's why we are where we are today. On the final note, are you projecting that Nigeria will ever come out of this economic hardship all through till even if you ask Tinubu this question, he will tell you that Nigeria will not come out of hardship. If you ask Tinubu what I meant Tinubu this question, he will tell you that Nigeria will not come out of hardship under him. So why are you not asking me that kind of question? When you know that even the person that is president, if you ask him, have you not heard the audio he made that he said that he knows that he has destroyed the economy, that he knows that his policies are hurting Nigerians. But do you see, the Tinubu that just bought jet is the one that you are expecting. Or the Tinubu that is proposing a tax bill is the one you are expecting that he would reverse his negative policies and that things, how can things get better under this kind of government? If you give Tinubu 300 years, things will never get better. Finally, two days around the corner, what advice do you have for us get better? My advice to Nigerians is very simple. That they must impress it upon the political actors to unite against the Tinubu government and the APC government. If, if, that if Nigerians do not come together and kill APC, APC will kill them and finish them off. You know? And that if Nigerians like, they should continue living in denial. And they should con the people that collected money in Edo, three days later, they're already hungry. The INEC official that compromised in Edo the money they collected has finished because the money has lost value. 20 million naira now has no value in the country. You cannot do anything with 20 million naira. So the, the compromise is not worth it. You know, the compromise, the silence, you know, the lack of integrity is not worth it. The only thing that can make this country work and function well is if we all come together and we, and we do what is right and get our country working back again. Thank you.